This is my first time being able to vote, and I want my vote to be a stance for the youth. I'm voting for future generations to come. Good afternoon, I am Elizabeth Mosley Hawkins, Director of Marketing and Communications for the 1890 Research and Extension Program at South Carolina State University. I am delighted to serve as the moderator for today's discussion. Uh, on behalf of the webinar participants, I wish to thank the National Black Caucus of State Legislators for giving us the opportunity to discuss the very important public value of our nation's 19 historically Black land-grant universities and colleges. Let's jump right into our webinar. Joining us today are Dr. Lewis Whitesides, Vice President and Executive Director of SC State University's 1890 Research and Extension, Dr. Edmund Buckner, Dean and Director of Alcorn State University's Land Grant Programs, Dr. Robert Taylor, Dean and Director of Florida A&M's Land Grant Programs, and Dr. Orlando Means, Chancellor and Dean of Southern University's Agricultural Research and Extension Center. Now, today we're going to talk about the ways in which HBCU land-grant universities contribute to the economic development of their respective state economies and perhaps provide guidance on how legislative partners can collaborate with these universities to spur economic development in their own states. Um, 1890s, as, they, as the collective system refers to these universities, have a long-standing history, 130 years, of, in fact, of providing life-changing educational opportunities to countless students and providing solutions to challenges our communities face through research and public service. Before we begin today's conversation, I would like to allow each participant the opportunity to share with us how their universities make a difference in the lives of individuals, families, and communities through their extension and research programs. And Dr. McMeans, we're gonna start with you first. All right, thank you. And it's an honor to be here. Uh, uh, at Southern University, uh, we are uh, the only uh, HBCU uh, system. And we have five campuses and uh, agriculture and uh, research and extension component are such significance in an agricultural state uh, from an economic vitality standpoint that uh, several years ago it was elevated to its own campus. Uh, there are a number of things that we're doing, but one of the things that I'm truly excited about is, is we have a mobile unit uh, that travels throughout the state of Louisiana, actually uh, uh, giving four different certifications in business, also in farm, farm safety, uh, we, we also do small animal ruminants. And so we're really happy about that. As a matter of fact, during the pandemic, we were able to graduate 250 individuals from this program as we took a, a virtual platform. Now, the thing that we really are known for uh, is being the first HBCU uh, to, to take from seed to shell uh, medical cannabis, uh, or we call medical marijuana program. That is that we are generating what you can get in a pharmacy grade medicine to be distributed to individuals that will not have the effect of opioids. And so we're really happy about that. We now have, as, as of today, we just added one. We have 13 products. And uh, so we are doing very well with the sale of those, everything, treating everything from epilepsy uh, all the way to, to pain, to, to uh, sleep deprivation. And so those monies are going back into uh, not only the community we serve, but we're also targeting minority and underserved communities, but also trying to keep the prices down. So we are targeting communities that cannot benefit from the, uh, the natural uh, purchasing of these meds. And so that one program there, uh, and I'll, I'll stop there, well, is one in which we can talk uh, forever, but um, the reason why this program is present is because of individuals uh, seeking alternative uh, medicines other than opioids. 
That's phenomenal. Thank you so much. Thank you. Now, Dr. Whitesides. Yes, ma'am, Liz. Well, at, at South Carolina State University, our 1890 program has been a cornerstone of our state and especially for the underserved communities for more than 100 years. Um, we have traced back the earliest mobile, the earliest actually extension vehicle that went out to the communities back to 1932. We actually have a picture of that and we have actually the details of the services that they offer. So, you know, we, we, we do programs in our four you know, land grant areas that most people do, forage and youth development. We have, you know, sustainable agriculture and natural resources. You know, but the one I want to talk about right quick is our community and economic development. And one thing the 1890s has always been good at is being resilient and putting together what we call issue-based teams. Right now, COVID is a big issue. And what is COVID really damaged? Our small business sector. So a lot of people losing jobs and those kind of things. Well, our issue-based team really got together and put programs together to help our small businesses make the transition from the traditional offerings that they actually have to the virtual offerings. Right now, we have 15 farmers that at, this would be their first time selling their greens online for Thanksgiving. And so with farmers actually taking a beating in the pandemic and those kind of things, this was a real great outlet for them. And the next thing is your retail outlets. If it wasn't for Amazon and some of these folks right now, would we really be getting products? So if our small businesses do not make the transition to at least having a major virtual offering, they won't be around. And actually statistics show that more than half of our small businesses will um, perish if not now, after the pandemic. So we've really made a real push into getting our small businesses up to, up to speed and making sure they make the transition so they can survive and thrive through this pandemic. Uh, we've helped countless businesses with the PPP loans have saved um, countless jobs throughout our state, um, making sure they can navigate the applications and those kind of things. So I, I'll stop there, Liz, but the, the South Carolina State's 1890 program has done phenomenal things and will continue to do so. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Whitesides. I'll toss it to Dr. Buckner. Thank you very much, Liz. Uh, here at Alcorn State University, we've been serving our community since 1871. Uh, that means that uh, we're, we're the first uh, 1890 land grant created in the United States. Uh, and in that capacity, uh, we've had a little time to try to align our research and our extension programs together to meet the needs of our rural communities and our, our um, limited resource farmers and uh, make sure that we're meeting their needs. And to that end, you know, the federal dollars that we receive for research and extension programs that, you know, are a hallmark of being a land grant, um, that's meant to be a direct pass through to the communities that we serve. And the way that it's a direct pass through is that um, we develop programs that are tailored to the needs of our local communities. And we talk a lot about rural communities, but we also, most 1890s also serve uh, urban areas in some capacity. Um, so that's an incredible public value. You know, it's a, it's a public value to the things that, you know, we're typically known for, like, like helping to develop and foster and encourage farmers markets and community gardens, uh, our family and community uh, consumer science uh, programs, which help limited resource families uh, with our health and wellness programs and with our physical activity programs. Uh, trying to fight obesity um, through our medicinal plants. Uh, you've heard Dr. McMeans talk about medical marijuana. Well, here in Mississippi, we just uh, had a state law that's uh, uh, made changes to our constitutional amendments so that we will also be working on that, hopefully in the, in the near future. Uh, and then, you know, of course, across the country, hemp has already uh, been legalized. And so we're working with our farmers in these new markets like this. Uh, but a really big one that's near and dear to my heart is is 4-H and positive youth development. Uh, one of the things that 1890s do really well is that we work with limited resource communities and areas that are underserved. And in urban areas, 4-H or are, are youth offerings to our, to our children in school, that's something that's, that's really underserved. No one serves them. So if we don't serve them, who will? And so that's a really key area that we're making sure that we don't leave behind. Um, of course, we work with special, specialty crops like peas, greens, sweet potatoes, spring mixes, shiitake mushrooms, you name it. Um, we're helping our farmers to get a, gain a toehold in these areas. 
But one of the areas that we're really, really uh, proud of is our product development center and also our product development store. Uh, and uh, like Dr. Uh, Whitesides mentioned, uh, that's one of the areas that we're using to try to help our communities uh, gain expertise in marketing, both in storefront, but now it's become increasingly more important to do that online through virtual offerings. Uh, and so that's, those are just a few of the things that we're working on here at Alcorn State University, and we'll talk more about those in depth later. Yes, we will. Thank you so much. Dr. Taylor. Thank you, Ms. Mosley Hawkins. Greetings from the highest of seven hills at Florida Agricultural and Mechanical University. I am delighted to be here today to join in this important conversation on economic impact of 1890 programs have in our country and the world. Our faculty is committed to educating students at all levels, preparing them to apply their knowledge critical thinking skills, and creativity in their service to society. FAMU is honored to be ranked as the highest ranked public HBCU, and we are the number one public HBCU for research and development. FAMU is also the number two HBCU for STEM major. As a, an 1890 university, we have a significant impact on the economy of the state of Florida, the nation, and the world through our research and extension programs. What makes FAMU excel in contributing to the quality of life through our research and extension programs? FAMU have a variety of research programs, and each of these impact the economy of the state and nation. Our research is also effective in international communities. Major areas of need are addressed through our research centers that include viticulture and small fruit research, preserving water quality of North Florida watersheds, and strategic research for the management of invasive species, and Florida Livestock Crop Improvement Program. Each of our CAFS research center, CAFS meaning the College of Agriculture and and Food Sciences Research Center has an advisory committee representing various agriculture industries, community, and business leaders. These communities and these, these committees help identify what are ways to encourage participation in long range planning. Our extension staff assist our community, communities through a variety of programs that help improve the economic viability of Florida, small and limited resource farmers, and of our local community residents from managing household financing to educating our youth on health, food, and nutrition, and engagement in agriculture. Much of our work and accomplishment would have to be, have been possible without the, would not have been possible without the financial support from the USDA, Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services, and Florida Legislature. We are grateful and look forward to this continued support, which enable us to strengthen our academic and research capacity and fulfill our land grant mission to benefit the citizens of Florida the nation and the world. As we proceed in the program, we will come or we will discuss more specific things for the benefit of our legislators. Thank you so much. And thank you to, to everybody for, um, I know, just giving us a little bit of, of what you all are doing at your universities. And, um, and this is just four, uh, four univer or three, four universities um, sharing with us um, the work that they do. Um, one of the things I think this, the common theme is that um, all of the land grant universities are able to adjust and more importantly, meet the immediate needs of the community, whether it's through forage and youth development, community economic development, agriculture, we all make the adjustments and, and provide programs and services as well as research or conduct research um, to help our communities. 
So I'm going to go ahead and dive a little bit deeper into uh, this conversation. And um, th th my first question is, why are 1890s important to the advancement of local and state economies? And I'll start with you, Dr. Whitesides. Okay, Liz. Well, 1890s are very important in the local economies for the first part that I talked about earlier in the introduction as far as advancing small business. Um, we know small business are, you know, employ more than half of the state's economies. So keeping our small businesses viable is uh, uh, very important to local and state economies. But another thing, if you think about it here in South Carolina, we're in 32 out of 46 counties. Um, in our state that we do direct programming, but we do direct spending there. So it's not national companies or things that provide our goods and services that we need to operate. It's our local vendors. And we make it a point to spend locally and get local businesses and local tradesmen and stuff to do things for us. So we contribute to the local economies for spending the dollars that we actually get locally and helping increase the local dollars by propping up or assisting our local businesses, our local farmers, you know, our local schools, everything that's entailed that, it, everything that entails making a community thrive, we support. And we could support with all of the programs that we actually provide. Okay. Dr. Taylor. Okay, why they're important because they serve an important sector of society, which is underserved. And I think we all will pretty much uh, say this, but function, this underserved uh, community function as frontline workers, as we can see from COVID-19. Also, history has shown that they are important in producing professionals from this underserved group, such as doctors, lawyers, engineers, teachers, social workers, agriculturalists, and others. In addition to this, they themselves provide jobs within the communities the HBCU serve. 1890 also produced entrepreneurs that engage in business and industry that is critical to the local and state economies. Thus, SAMU is committed to providing pathways for social and economic mobility while providing jobs for our graduates to benefit our communities. Thank you. Dr. Buckner, do you have anything you would like to add? Well, I think they've done a pretty good job of kind of summing it up, but I, I will say that, you know, part of our mission is that we serve the underserved. Uh, and it's not mentioned in the mission, but it's sometimes implied that our communities have been disenfranchised throughout history. And with this historical perspective, you know, we've got to bridge that gap. We are really standing in the gap, providing resources uh, through information, uh, through technology transfer. Uh, and these are some things that are, that are just, I can't say how important they are uh, for our rural communities, for our farmers, our ranchers, our business, small businesses. These are things that are definitely needed. And if we don't provide them, then they will go lacking. And that's something that I think is a calling, excuse me, if you will, a calling from God for us to be able to serve our fellow uh, man and woman uh, to help them to improve their plight in life. Dr. McMeans. Uh, I, I think my colleagues did an excellent job of uh, summing up what we all 1890s uh, uh, represent. Uh, I, I will add that the one thing that's been continuous through uh, our respective foundings to this point is that we were established or given a status as an 1890 land grant to serve those individuals who were not otherwise served and provide opportunities for those individuals who were not provided opportunity. We were the only universities that can say our founding is more relevant and important when we were founded than it is today. We have the same mission. And what the pandemic has elucidated is that things that we've already known in our communities that we serve. We've had these health disparities. We've had these uh, detached e economically 
uh, business failings, uh, low income. And now we are even more relevant because now we know that we need to up our game and we are hoping uh, that our respective legislators understand that we can hone in on those communities most impacted economically because we live there and we are already there. So to empower us and give us an opportunity to expand our footprint in those communities so that we can lift them up from an uh, economic standpoint. So I'm, I'm excited. Uh, I, I, every time I go to Tuskegee, I, I like to see that lift in the veil of ignorance. That I, I, I don't think we were necessarily uh, uh, what uh, what we were thinking of what he was thinking about when they when they built that statue. But what that statue is saying is that we have a whole communities of people that did not know that those were these disparities that were happening in 2020. We knew, but with limited resources that we have, we've not been able to serve. So I, I think this is an opportunity for the 1890s to be even more relevant as it relates to economic vitalities of the community and citizens we collectively serve. And if Liz, if I can, if I can jump back in here, um, another thing I, I really would want to add is the economic impact to our communities is probably tenfold. For every dollar that's invested into a 1890, the community can reap $10 from each dollar that's actually invested into 1890 based on the things that we actually do. So you can't beat that investment anyway. So the investment of 1890s is really, really worth it. Excellent point. So let me shift a little bit. I think we, we kind of talked about that in the beginning and, and even um, with our um, conversation. But when we talk about contributions to the economy, we know, you know, of course, historically, like um, Dr. Taylor said, um, land grant universities, um, help increase economic development through workforce development and, you know, making sure that we provide qualified professionals who can go out and, and lead in their respective um, fields. But, but what other um, contributions would you all say that land-grant universities make or have made to progress our, um, our economies? Anyone want to jump in, Ken? <laughs> Can I jump in here? Yeah, absolutely. Yes. I, I think that we have also played an important role in um, educating and uh, having an impact on, I would say, countries like Africa, our mother country. Yes. You know, um, and because of that, you know, that some of those countries are actually getting um, their food and other supplies from the United States. So there is a, uh, an increase in, um, you know, our footprint throughout the world because of the presence of uh, these 1890 schools, especially in African, Latin American and Caribbean countries. I think that's a very, a very good point. Um, mentioning our footprint internationally, um, that we recognize the importance of, of making sure that it's not just at home, but a, across the globe. Well, Liz, if I, if I can jump in here also, the when, when I think about the true value of 1890s and how we contribute, you know, to our state's economy, I think about the access to education that a lot of the folks in our rural communities would not get if it was not for 1890s. You know, you think about a lot of your other universities now, they're chasing the Newsweek and the US News and World Report rankings and, and those kind of things. So they have tightened up their admission standards. Now, 1890s and land grant universities were founded on the basis of educating the common man. You know, I'll give you a personal story for me. Like um, my mother grew up on a farm and she did not want a farm. She did everything she could to get off of that farm. And she went to HBCU. You know, she was the only one in the first one in her family to go. But all it took was one. Because when she went and graduated, me, my brother, and my sister all graduated from college. 
And that's what we do. So we not only change one person, we change families. So if one person can get to HBCU, I tell them all the time, you can just get to their gates. We take care of them, we clean them up, and we send them out. And when they go back to their communities, they go back a different person. They become leaders. They become doctors, as, as Dr. Taylor said. They become lawyers. They become all these folks. But without the access to the land grant 1890 universities, those things will not happen. Good point. Anyone else? I, I, I would just um, chime in to say a, a, another area um, that I'm proud of is that during the pandemic, there was uh, loans and, and other federal aid that were available mm -hmm. uh, to farmers, to ranchers, to growers. Well, the community that we serve here in Louisiana, and I can probably say that in, in my other colleagues' respective states, is that those individuals have never seen these farms. They, they need assistance. You know, with our mobile unit, we were able to go around and help them through spacing, uh, and, and wearing masks and, and setting up tables outdoors and providing laptops to make sure that those uh, communities continue to be economically vibrant. Um, because what we have to understand is that uh, when we look at the larger scale farmers, millions upon millions, if not billions of dollars generated, um, their access on, uh, to, to accountants, their access to technology. They don't depend on the broadband as to the extent that we depend on, or we as in our clientele. And so they're, they're, we, we provide those opportunities for the, for the, the so-called man that gets left out. And I, I'm, I'm so proud of that fact. And, and we have a lot of challenges on the horizon for uh, our small and minority farmers. But one thing I can say, I'm 100% certain that in these 18 states that we have uh, 1890s that are going to do their best to make sure that we, we try to sustain uh, our, our small and minority farmers. You know, I'd like to piggyback on what Dr. McMeans just mentioned. You know, with this uh, COVID relief funding that, that uh, has been offered, he's totally right. He's right on point because we've had, uh, we've got aging uh, farm populations uh, some of our farmers don't have access to internet. Uh, and if they do, they don't have email addresses. And many of these applications require you to email or have an email address. And so that really would have left us and our farmers out. And so, you know, that's one really important area where 1890s across the board have been able to step in and bridge that gap. And so Dr. McMeans was totally on point. And that's, that's something that I know that several uh, 1890s had to do. And across the 1890s as well, you know, we've got some serious, uh, some serious scientific accomplishments. Uh, we've got uh, researchers that are doing some really great work, hold patents in many different areas like the food products and health uh, issues, uh, plant special genetic properties. Um, I think Dr. McMeans even has an insect that's named after him. So we're, we're doing first discovery. Uh -huh. We've got first discovery, yeah. first time discoveries. Um, the importance of that is that the students that attend our universities are exposed to that level of expertise uh -huh. and they've never been exposed to the expertise before. That means they're prepared to go on to graduate school, whether they stay at the 1890s or matriculate in 1862 or at an Ivy League school. Wherever they go, they're prepared to do that and make meaningful contributions to society. Um, you know, that's, that's just the tip of the iceberg. You know, it's Without 1890s, you, would, you wouldn't see the level of success in limited resource populations and minority populations that you see today. We're an integral part of the fabric of the nation as far as that's concerned. I, I love that you talked about um, research and development because that is definitely one of the ways in, in which um, you can help spur an, e an economy through, through those innovations. And so I just want to take a little bit of time for any of our um, participants, if you want to talk about how research um, and, and innovation that you have discovered, how that has helped contribute to, to the economy and, and, and how that will help in the future. One, one of the things I, I, I would say, and it's early in the stages, um, uh, I think uh, Dr. Buckner may have spoke to it earlier, but but uh, we, we are in that hemp space. Um, 
Um, we found out some interesting things about him. <laughs> One of the things that we have to do in him, and I'm going to say this because I think this is appropriate audience to say this. We do not set our minority farmers up to fail, right? Amen. Growing hemp, when you start a hemp crop, it's expensive. It's hemp seed is expensive. If you grow hemp and you put it out in the field right now or, or in the spring, the weeds are going to grow. It requires, I mean, heavy hands-on. That's why every picture you see now with hemp growing is in a greenhouse. You very seldom see pictures with hemp growing in the field. Uh, uh, Southern University and LSU found that out the hard way. Now, we may be speaking for Louisiana, but we're 100% certain that we need to grow these things. In the house. But, what, but what I told the, the Commissioner of Agriculture here, and I said, Mr. Commissioner, I said, so what are you going to do when these crops are considered hot? That means more than 0.3% THC. And you have to burn them and turn them over. Our farmers can't afford to, first of all, grow something that was expensive. You no know, telling what they had to put up. And, and then all of a sudden, you telling me I got to burn it and turn it over? That's a law, state law. So what we're doing right now, we have an excellent plant scientist. She's an agronomist. She has developed this drone technology that you, that you, uh, Dr. Buckner knows who's I'm talking about. So thank you, Dr. Buckner. She's a great, great faculty member. <laughs> You're welcome. We're so happy we can support Southern University <laughs> with our, uh, with our uh, but, expertise. <laughs> but, but she's developing technology that will be able to uh, pinpoint that and tell what percentage by the ultraviolet rays or the color that's coming off of the plant. And that, and then we can we can stop the grower in mid stride and say no no no, we got to look at remediation type activities how we can get that percentage of THC down by adding X to the soil or whatever, and I think that technology for our farmers uh any of our farmers, and uh, I think that will be very very helpful. So what Dr. Buckner said earlier, we have the mental capacity. Sometimes we just don't have the resources. I mean, look. Uh -huh. A and T and what they did with the peanut. I mean, I mean, I mean, with the peanut butter. I mean, I, everybody, uh -huh. the world is benefiting from that. I mean, so we have the the intellectual uh, capacity. It is whether or not we're getting the resources in order for our faculty and our special our research science to flourish in research and development. So my my question is: Are we in answering the second question now? Are we? Just a conversation. Just a conversation. Yes, sir. Okay, I I can um, point out to you some of the the uh, breakthroughs that have occurred, you know, in our programs and in, in uh, relative to our state. For example, FAMU Center for Biological Control provides leadership in safeguarding agricultural from invasive pests. The center is pioneering the development of a successful microbial control strategy for the veromite, the most destructive pest of the honeybee. Bee health is critical for the success of pollination-based agriculture in the US. Honeybee pollination ser services are estimated at 24 billion each year. So you know, how important honeybee is. In fact, I, I can tell you, I've, I've been trying to grow some plants and I, I couldn't see any bee. And I was really worried about would I get my vegetables? You know, will there be pollination? Okay, another example is a family graduate student and research assistant. Here is the role that we play in training these students from this same center. His, his name is Warren Diedrich is the first to discover an efficient egg parasitoid in Florida used to manage the kudzu bug, which is destructive invasive pests. This discovery helped avoid the need for the use of pesticides in soybean production. 
Soybean is the second most planted pea crop in the U.S., which has an estimated annual revenue of $39 billion. And going, going forward, FAMU Center for Viticulture and Small Fruits was granted um, patents for three new Muscadine grape cultivar, Majesty, Floriana, Florida Onyx, and granted one utility patent for molecular grape disease markers. These new muscadine cultivars are of great importance for the economic vitality of the grape and wine industry in Florida and the Southern United States. So I think that we are probably the leader in the world in grape, um, in muscadine grape research, right? And we have actually uh, figured out the, the, the first to uncover the genomics the gene sequence of the muscadine grape. Now, the Center for Small Fruit Development Program evaluates economic feasibility of growing non-traditional fruits in North Florida and seeks to develop integrated pest management practices for North Florida. I can tell you because I just received the news yesterday that our um, IPM team won the international award throughout the whole world. The team won and, and we're gonna get a, a plaque for that. And it came from at 1890 school. So we also have work going on in livestock and crop improvement located at the Brooksville Agricultural and Environmental Research Station. I think some of you know, we recently got 3,800 acres of land from the, the largest in present time from the USDA. And, our, and we have the Quincy Farm research going. Uh, I would say that, you know, this program creates land-based economic opportunities that help the Brooksville and Hernando areas to be economically viable and self-sustaining. For those of you who don't know Florida, Brooksville is about 200 miles away, almost, you know, in, in South Central Florida, but we haven't an impact that far. And uh, lastly, I will, will mention, because I can go on and on, that uh, the research and extension include a 267-acre farm that provides hands-on training for small-scale farmers through its education and outreach. FAMU also provide educational support and programs to families, individuals, and youth in our community. Last year, FAMU provided training and assistance to 752 persons on, the home, on home ownership. This resulted in 17 families purchasing homes with, which, uh, with approved loans of over 1.7 million. So I'm gonna stop there. <laughs> Well, if I can if I can jump in um, to talk about some research, Liz. Uh, well, as you know, we have uh, two dynamic things that uh, I want everybody to kind of know. First of all, we um, that's some big stuff that Dr. McMeans and Dr. Taylor have talked about. It. As, you, as you know, as you all can see, the 1890s are second to none when it comes to research and the cutting edge research that that we actually do. We have some scientists here, Dr. Ahmed and Dr. Leela, that were the first to discover the change in DNA and diabetes. We hadn't talked a lot about health, but health disparities is a big deal in our communities. And the 1890s addressed those with our family nutrition and health programs. Um, so what does it mean for them to be the first to discover the change in DNA? Diabetes ravage, ravages our communities and what that means is when you contract diabetes, your DNA changes to a diabetic DNA. They were the first to pinpoint the change in that DNA to someone that's contracting diabetes. So if you think about it, think about going to the doctor, taking a skin test or a urine test or a blood test. The next step is to develop a test for changes in DNA with diabetes. So if you imagine you going into your doctor and they do a test and say, hey, let me, let me, let me you know, test your DNA. And they start to see the change in your DNA toward a diabetic DNA, the interventions can happen then and you never, you never contract diabetes. That's how big this thing can really be. 
And so we're really excited about that. Uh, and so uh, we're the first to discover it. It's already public ocean, all over our lands and those kind of things. When you get to the number three plastic, it can't be recycled. What Dr. Hamidi kind of talked about was, okay, it's a petroleum base. So we have to be able to get it back to his petroleum state. So he's been able to get the unrecyclable plastic back to the petroleum state from what it is. And the waste from that can be disposed of without it harming the community. More so, the fuel from it can be used to power vehicles. So if you think about your landfills for all the counties and all the plastics out there, if we can come up with a machine and the right mix of additives to that fuel to power the actual county vehicles or all vehicles, that will be another fuel source we can use um, from, you know, the wasted plastics that's, that's actually polluting our communities. Great. Thank you. See, we can talk all day about it. All day. <laughs> but we don't have all day. Um, just have a few <laughs> minutes left. <laughs> and I just want to, we have, um, you know, this this webinar is, is for, um, for our legislators. And so while we have their ear, I just want to take a few minutes um, for us to talk about what we need, need from our legislators. How can they be more engaged in the process of collaborations to, to help support a thriving uh, economic ecosystem. Who want to start? <laughs> this, this is a great question as, as far as I can see. Uh, from our perspective, we think legislators should sponsor and see the enactment of laws that would address past deficiencies and inequities, as well as create new opportunities in regard to funding 1890 HBCUs. And uh, I think all of us, I am a product of, uh, you might say, of, of eight, eight, three uh, land grant universities. And I've, uh, my first degree was in uh, at Tuskegee. And I, I then went on to the 1862 school. But uh, what, what is uh, very clear when I, and I worked at Alabama a for 30 years before coming to Fannie. And, and Dr. McMeans know that he was one of the students in the fold. Oh, wow. Yeah, at <laughs> Alabama a &M. But what, what was very clear, you know, and I don't want to go into details, but we never got the kind of funding you know, and until, you know, maybe it was in the 70s that we would, I think before that we were getting $2,000 for research, you know, from the state, that was all. And then it wasn't until our, our president uh, Morrison and, and, uh, and a congressman went to Congress and said, no, let them send the money directly to the state you know, right to us and the university rather than to the state. So there is that inequity that needs to be, uh, this should allow, you know, us to serve our communities and stakeholders more efficiently if those inequities can be made up. Uh, our research centers seek input from stakeholders at various levels and from multiple sources, such as the Florida Department of Agriculture, and consumer services, Florida Department of Environmental Protection, Florida Grape Growers and the Wine Association, Florida Pest Control Association, Florida Water Management District, and 1862 grant institutions. Participate in these councils will, will, as in other forums, allow for a follow-up discussion concerning FAMU's existing research priorities and how they address, you know, uh, stakeholders' needs. And I think this, this is what we all need to be uh, certain that we're doing, that we're really addressing our national problems, yes, but first by focusing on our, what our stakeholders need, which is the underserved uh, population for most of our students. And if, if, if I can kind of jump in right quick, I think a, another thing our, our great um, legislators can actually do is, is be an advocate for us. You know, just be an advocate for us, especially when big initiatives or 
big announcements, huge companies and things are coming to our states. And you know, when they're negotiating the terms, a lot of times your larger institutions get endowed chairs, they get you know, a lot of funding for research in the industries that they come in. And we're normally left out. A lot of times when, when we are called upon, you know, all the decisions have been made. Uh, most of the funding had already been, you know, allocated. And then they'll say, hey, you know what? Let's invite the 1890 to the table. Well, by then, it's $10,000 left out of 10 million. And they say they give us travel money or something like that. So just be an advocate for us. Um, I, I think on, on, on this webinar, you've seen that we have the expertise. Um, to do to go head to head with any university, um, we we have the reach into the communities. A lot of times, the the communities the communities that we serve are ones that's left out, and if we don't begin to address them, they'll continue to be left out. And you know, we we have the the the, the wherewithal, and we want to do it. So it's not just a job to us; it's, it's a calling. When you work at an eighteen ninety, it is a calling, and and it's something that we want to do, and we want to leave legacies and make sure our communities are better than what we found them. And that's why we, we work so hard in them every day. And I, and I guess I would uh, also kind of jump in there and add that um, we just need you to continue to fight for us and fight for our communities. You know, the struggle is by no means over. We've seen uh, by the demonstrations on the news and uh, all the recent events that the struggle is definitely not over. Um, we've got connections in the counties. We actually serve communities, rural communities and urban communities in the counties within the states. We have... Uh, a base uh, that we serve that is vast statewide. Um, but, you know, I guess one of the things we've got to do is we've got to do a better job of communicating our accomplishments, our vision, mm -hmm. our needs, our community's needs. Uh, and then if there's something or some piece of information that you don't have, just let us know. And we want to give you that ammunition so you can continue to fight for us because it means the, the basis, it means the difference between life and death in some cases. Uh, you know, part of that is that we have federal dollars because we land grants, but we also require state match. Uh, and mm -hmm. many of our states are not getting the state match. In some cases, they're not even getting half of what the state uh, match which should be going to those schools. And those dollars, here again, are direct pass through to these communities so that we can accomplish this mission of serving underserved populations. And so just please continue to fight for us and help us to get you the ammunition that you need so that you can continue to fight for us. And, uh... And to add something to that, I think one thing that uh, legislatures can help us with is by uh, giving us uh, some sort of support in us actually uh, having an impact at, I, I think at the, the uh, I would say the middle school and high school levels in our communities. I, I know that, uh, you know, we have a job to do in terms of educating um, those who enter in the university. But I think it all starts at uh, actually from the middle school. And I think that we, we need to have a, a greater impact so that we can determine who actually comes in our colleges. Because many times we find that many of the students don't have the necessary, especially in the STEM areas training, but if we can reach down there, and that takes extra money that universities usually don't have unless special programs are, are there to reach down in, into those uh, communities and, and impact and set what, what I call pathways and uh, also, um, yeah, I just will call it pathways to actually um, bring that those people from that community into our universities. Yeah, and I, I just I just wanted to add, uh, I, I have had the unique pleasure and honor to work with the Louisiana Legislative Black Caucus, uh, 50 plus individuals who uh, have been spectacular. Uh, we had the best session that we've had in history, according to Southern University and the five campuses where we were able to actually get a million dollars above our state match, uh, which we're using specifically to support everything that we talked about that the pandemic has. We, nutrition, uh, horticulture, you name it. I knew aquaculture program and some other things. And so I, you know, they, they have done a phenomenal job. But I, 
Uh, but I think uh, both doctors, uh, Buckner and Whiteside, hit on two things. We got to tell our story because we either we tell our story or let somebody else tell it for us, and they put a spin on there that we may not want. The other thing is to talk about that, that ROI, uh, the return on investment. For every dollar you give us, this is what we're returning to the economy of Louisiana, not the economy of South Carolina State or FAMU, uh, Alcorn State, it's the states in which we reside. Mm -hmm. We're doing so. Just think about if you gave us two dollars. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Just think about if you gave us two dollars, what we could do with that. You know, change the world. <laughs> exactly, yeah. and, I, and I just think, I just think, but, but we have to do the work. Uh, well, well, we work with our business, in our college or business people in the College of Business. Whatever we need to do to put that financial spin on it, we need to do that, but we need to tell our story. Because when I talked to the legislators, they said, we had no idea yes. you guys had this particular program. I get that every time we talk to them. So we we, we got to do a better job. Yes. Right. And if, if I could, And if I could just add to that, we want y'all to visit our campuses and visit our research stations and visit the actual programs that we actually do. So, you know, if you get some free time in your schedule, and I know it's hard, but we get some free time in your schedule, just head on down to the 1890 and see what they have to offer. And you'll see a whole lot more than what we talked about here. Thank you so much, Dr. Whitesides. I think we all can agree um, to, to Dr. McMean's point. Um, an investment in 1890s is an investment in the advancement of your state. So thank you all to our participants, um, Dr. Robert Taylor, Dr. Orlando Means, um, Dr. Edmund Buckner, and Dr. Lewis Whitesides. Thank you so much. And thank you again to the National Black Caucus of State Legislators. When they told me it was multiple myeloma, I knew I was in for it. Everything you hear about African-Americans and cancer didn't help either. But you know something? I didn't let it stop me. I did my research and worked with my doctor to learn about my options. With myeloma, you can't back down. You gotta keep it moving.
When they told me it was multiple myeloma, I knew I was in for it. Everything you hear about African Americans and cancer didn't help either. But you know something? I didn't let it stop me. I did my research and worked with my doctor to learn about my options. With myeloma, you can't back down. You gotta keep it moving. I felt like when I took the full-time role, not only was it Walmart like inviting me in to like join the team, but I also felt comfortable here. Over 95,000 temporary COVID hires hired permanently since March. Live better together. Walmart.